for being recorded. So as many of you know, I am Suzanne Gandhi Inglesby, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you very much for coming out, despite the rain, and thank you for those of you who are joining us online. Hello. Um, I also want to introduce our director, Eileen Julian, um, and we are very pleased to have you join us for these conversations, and we hope that you'll be able to join us in the future for our next, as well, on the 30th. Um, this is the second of the three events. We were very pleased with the discussion last time and hope that it was helpful to those of you who attended. And the link to that is available on our website now if you want to go back and reference it. And the link to this will be on our website we assume later this week. Um, we hope that this will be useful to you. We'll give you a chance to ask some specific questions of our speakers who have quite a bit of experience that they can share. And if you have a question that none of us are able to answer today, we can look into it more and try to find additional information for you. So please feel free to have conversation and questions during this time. This roundtable series is one of the ways that we seek to serve associate professors. Another that I hope all of you are aware of is our residential fellows position. Right now we are accepting applications for that. Uh, that we're accepting the applications through Friday. That uh, provides an office in our space over in Eigenman Hall and $1,000 in research support funds. So if that's something you're interested in, please go to our website, take a look at that. It's under uh, resources for associate professors. There's a link to the residential fellows page, and I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording, but please, if you have to leave early, do not hesitate to do so. And I was asked by someone who was going to have to slip out to please let our speakers know that that would happen in the Please not take that personally. It's actually a compliment that they're here for as much of the session as they can attend today. So if anybody does need to slip out, please do so. Could we, I think we have somebody who'd like to come in. Could you open the door for them, please? Thanks. Thanks very much. Sociology. We thank them both for their time and their willingness to share their experience and expertise with us. And the format is that I'm going to let each of them speak, and then we will open the floor to questions after that. So without further ado, I'll turn this over to them. Um, we all hear stories about promotion, and most of our stories about promotion, even when they turn out really well, are sort of horrific. Um, and I was trying to think through um, my storyline and then think through the storylines of some friends. Um, in, in my case, for some really odd reason, when I was an associate professor, I was invited by the college or summoned by the college to serve on the promotion committee that was promoting people to fall. So I was the token associate professor on that committee. I have no idea if they have that do that anymore. That's good. You were probably last year. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. no, no, it could be. But um, but it was very odd because I was ha I, I was I was looking at the committee from um, you know two different stand well three different stands. First of all, the masochist who agreed to be on the committee, uh, but also someone who was trying to make some decisions regarding the decision about the promotion, and then looking at it from a very self interested perspective. These are the people or the type of people who are going to be making a decision about me maybe next year. And so I, I was really paying a lot of attention to what they, they said. Um, and there were several things I was really surprised by. Um, the first one was it was a very, very serious committee at the college level. Very serious. And it paid a great deal of attention to pretty much everything. And I really didn't anticipate that. Second thing was, I was probably the toughest person on the committee. I think before you get in, you think there's this bigger leap to get to get to become promotion, to get promoted. And the others were probably, I would say, more humane. Um, third, related to that, when the vote was not positive, or when the vote was not positive enough, as in there were several no's, um, it really pained the committee, mostly. I mean, it was sort of 
we, the committee clearly wanted people to do well. And um, with the one exception that the committee was annoyed, and I think justifiably so, when materials were provided in a way that either the materials were incomplete or even worse, purposely incomplete, uh, the, and, or where there was some real slippery slippage or I'd say slipperiness, for example, what appeared to be some obvious conflicts of interest by letter writers, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, I left the committee thinking, okay, college is pretty reasonable and not as tough as I thought. It must be my department. Once I became, once I was promoted, I discovered that, well, my department's pretty tough, but it's not as tough as I thought either. Um, one thing I realized is the department really wanted to see success stories. They wanted to see promotion. And part of it's pure self-interest. If you're in a department and you don't have that many fact full, prep, full professors, you want more so they can do more service. I suspect that several of you, when you became tenured, discovered, oh my god, I am now no longer protected as being an assistant professor who can say, no, I can't do service. Well, it gets even more intensified, to put it that way, once you're promoted at fault. And so, as one colleague of mine said the other day, and she was talking about people being promoted to become a social professor, she says, can't we just promote all the assistant professors now so I don't have to do as much work? And um, it's the same thing at the full level. I mean, there's just a pure vested interest, I think, on the part of departments for people to become full. But I think it's more than that. Um, and that is, um, departments typically, and I think there's variation departments, so I can speak about my departments and departments of some colleagues of my friends of mine that I know. I mean, people, you know, these are our colleagues. These are people we, we care about at, at some type of level. We don't really want to see failure. We don't want to see people feel that they are failures in any any form. So departments, at least my department, wants to see success. At the same time, the department is risk averse. And I think this is another component of promotion. And the risk averseness is mostly about what happens if you put somebody up and then at the higher levels the answer is no. And I mean, to me, that's probably the worst scenario. You know, that that's a scenario that it's more that's more challenging for a lot of many people. And so, this is strange combination. You want real success, and but you're also going to be a little risk averse. And it sort of helped me to understand cases of some friends of mine and me when we went up for promotion, or when we did not go up for promotion, as the case may be. Now, Suzanne asked me to answer several questions. Broadly, what does your department seek in a full professor? And then asked I talk a little bit about the timeline, naming the promotion committee, the process of obtaining lists of external reviewers and contacting them, departmental access to materials and votes. So the, the big broad question is, what does my department seek in a full professor? And again, there may well be a great deal of variation by departments. I mean, I think the first thing that we want is we want people who at this point really have made it. And you know, the people people who are now known and respected in their field. Now, that's a really broad, slippery, talk about slippery concept, and it can mean many, many different things. But it's people who really have they're they're established in their field. At the same time, we want people who have been good citizens of our department and people who have taken teaching very, very seriously. I know, that's sort of like, you probably hear that everywhere. Good teaching, good terror service, good research. But I think it really is true. Um, more specifically about the details on it, um, timelines vary, I think, by different departments on how they approach. Let me tell you a little bit about what, what we do. In my department, in January, the full professors meet. And the full professors before the meeting are given the CVs of all the associate professors. Uh, actually, the assistant professors as well, because theoretically the assistant professors could go up for fall, or, but, but the focus is really associate professors. And at the same time, I, the chair talks to all the associate professors to, act, to get a sense of whether or not they want to go up for fall. And if not, just to sort of, sort of 
talk through what the plan's going to be and what they think they need to be doing. The departments, the full members then meet and discuss the cases of each case, regardless of whether they want to go up or not go up for tenure, so that we can give guidance to each person about where they are. Um, I I'll tell you that that guidance is both really reassuring and really infuriating, I think. Um, I don't know if your departments do the same thing, but I mean, one hand, it gives people a little bit more of a sense of control of what you need to do. On the other hand, you know, so to say, well, you're not there yet, you need blank, is it's not always the most positive message to receive. So, so that's what happens in terms of, so at that point, the department may determine that there's several people who want to go up for, for promotion, and it may well be that those people do want to go up. And at that point, um, you know, at, at, at that point, if the associate professor does want to go up, um, there's, we get about a month, a month and a half to get their materials ready, and they have to have materials ready for the department in March. Sounds really early, I know. Promotion is really for the following year. But we want, what we want to do is we want to have a review done before the end of the spring semester, at least a review of the department. Um, the reason we do this, and, and the materials we ask are pretty much the same materials that you would provide for if you were going for a promotion. It's the, you know, everything that you would be having to submit for the college and the VPFAA. Um, but we, 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 I then, we then choose a committee, uh, the chair chooses a committee, uh, and has the committee, uh, a subcommittee, I'll tell you a little bit about the selection committee in a minute, and they meet with the committee to discuss the report, and um, the committee comes up with a report, the department meets, meets maybe once, maybe twice, usually twice actually, um, and um, we want the report pretty much, we want to have a sense of what we believe even before letters come in. Um, and I, I, I have people from other departments who are saying, you've got to be kidding me, the letters should matter. And our sense is the letters should matter, but we should be able to make an independent judgment. And we should be able to have a sense, and we should know the person's record even better than the external letters, letter writers coming in. So <laughs> that's what we do. And at that point, we just put it on hold, and um, we get letters, and we meet again in the fall, go through the letters, um, um, and vote. And then um, the, the report is submitted, including a chair's letter on this. This is the other thing that surprised me. Uh, and I really didn't fully appreciate that until this past year when I became chair. Uh, and that is, there's a lot of work involved on this. I mean, there's a lot of work on the part of the committee, but then there's a large, great deal of work on the part of the chair. So one thing that I think is a real useful thing to realize, if you as a chair are writing something up and you're trying to write a case for promotion, by the time you're done working on it, you have to have convinced yourself. And so you really don't want to lose at that point. And I suspect that's the experience of a lot of chairs on that. OK, maybe the promotion committee. Uh, com departments really will vary a lot, I think, on this as well. In my department, we still have a large enough critical mass that we should be able to have a committee where there's at least one or two people who are pretty close to the person's substantive or methodological area. Uh, but at the same time, we do think of ourselves as a generalist department in which anybody should be able to read the work in our department to send anybody else. They may not be able to read it from certain perspectives, but they still should be able to gauge logic, you know, the reasoning. They should be able to gauge the clarity uh, in terms of research. Any of us should be able to assess teaching, and any of us should be able to assess service. So, in the committee, we, we, we have a committee, and the committee will vary in size. Um, typically, it will be three or four people. Um, this past year, we had two promotion cases and a tenure case. I ended up with every full professor in the department who was eligible serving on one of the two promotion cases, and actually one person double dipping. Um, the other factor to take into account, so in this case, I didn't really have to worry about fairness of service assignments. But sometimes in the selection of committees, I imagine chairs are going to have to think through, well, this person's a really good member in terms of these reviews, but is on the review committee every single year. 
So I assume people take into account some notion of fairness on that. Um, the other thing that I, I emphasize in our, we emphasize in our department, it, again, is regardless of whether you're on the promotion committee, you really are expected to have read everything. And again, I suspect departments really bear on it, um, but I, I'm hopeful that most departments take it comparably serious. The other thing that I found very interesting was the selection of letter writers. And I think this is one part that really intimidates people. I mean, we all are, many of us are um, control freaks. We want to have control over everything. And probably the thing we have the least amount of control on as the, the associate professor and also the department is what happens with the letters. We just don't know for sure. And I think, um, so we rely on some collective wisdom in trying to get some sense of who can write good letters. Now, the official policy is that the professor is supposed to come up with his or her list of names and supposed to justify the person, point out any potential conflicts of interest. At the same time, we are supposed to come up with an independent list of names. And that's the way it is and that's the way it should be. I think the reality is a little murkier because that assumes you never speak to your colleagues. And through the years, you probably have a sense of who are the people in this person's field who really are the key players in the field and what roles have they had one way or another in these people's lives. And so, so, I, I, so I think there's a certain amount of collective wisdom as we go through those on it. Um, there are other rules, and they sort of vary, I think, by who you're dealing with and what schools you're in uh, and who you're dealing with at upper levels um, in terms of what you can and cannot, who you, who you can and who you can't invite or invite, ask to serve to, to write these letters. Um, clearly, it has to be someone who's distinguished in the field. And you have to be able to make an argument. You know, just because the person's a professor at a school doesn't tell you enough. And there has to be something in the record that you can really pinpoint. Uh, it could be being an editor. It could be being very much affiliated with your national association. It could be being the recipient of certain types of fields. But it really should be people that there should be no doubt that that person should be able to write a letter. And I, I think that's and I think that's a hard thing for people to do. Um, it also the tricky thing also is about choosing people what institutions to choose from. Now, I understand most institutions are going to say you want to get people from your peer or aspirant institutions. But there's, academics has changed so that there are really, really distinguished professors who may not be at the peer and aspirant institutions. And I think that probably involves a little bit more effort on the part of the associate professor and on the part of the chair to make that argument. Um, the other issue, there are a couple other issues that people have mentioned, and I, I, I'll just tell you these are concerns some people have said. Some people believe that a person who has reviewed someone's book should not be allowed to write a letter. I think that is an unwise decision rule. I'll be kind on that. But I will tell you, some people have, have that view. Um, so. Um, that, so that might mean that if you are aware of that rule, you don't necessarily provide all information as a chair that you're describing. You're not, you're not, you're, in terms of what you described as the credentials of the person. Um, the other, well, no, it's, no. Um, the other question is whether or not you can submit people from the same school. I think the general principle is even if it's a very top school in, in your area, this, the university would prefer only one person. That you can have two people on your list, but if the first person says yes, just skip the second. Um, and then the other issue is the question of conflict of interest. And I think people have very, very different views of what conflict of interest means. Um, and um, we can talk about different interpretations of it, but I think you need to talk to your chair or the committee uh, about you know, when you're coming up with your list of what would what would be a conflict of interest along the way. You know, in in the case of um, when I was on the committee, this was a while back. Um, there was one person who went up who had a 
had several names that they may not have been relatives, but they were awfully, awfully close. And it sort of, you know, it made things a little bit more difficult to make a decision. Uh, regarding the request for letters, people always want to know. There's usually a template. There's a template provided by most schools, and you alter the template um, a little bit. Um, it is interesting to, to figure out, realize that as chair, you you are trying to sell something, and sell something is get these people to agree to write letters. Uh, I was really lucky this past year because we had three cases. Two of them, every single person I contacted said yes. And I was told, you're never going to see that, and it happened. And the other case was a really pretty easy case as well. Although, yeah, I did have to negotiate with one person about dates. He said, he or she said, I can have it by this date. I said, no, that's a little too late. How about this date? And said, How about this date? And we found a reasonable medium on that. When the letters come in, the committee, the department has to discuss the letters. Because letters can be screwy. That's the other thing that's surprising. And the people who you think are going to write the screwy letters are not necessarily the ones. Screwy doesn't mean a bad letter, it just means occasionally could be idiosyncratic. Or it could be that they're privileging one thing that maybe your department or college or university does not. So, uh, for example, in my department you do not need to have a book to be promoted. We are it's a department that's a book and a, it's a book and an article department. And so people say, well this person doesn't have a book may not be really meaningful for us, but we would have to explain that in the chair's letter. Okay, those are letters. Um, I was asked about access to materials and votes in the department as well. In terms of access to materials, um, we, we switched it. In the, in the good old days, we had paper copies. There were these big paper copies in our fiscal office, officer's office, and people would go there. They would sign out, bring it back, sign out, bring it back. I miss those old days. I think it's so much easier for me to comb through that than to go through all the different files that may not be as intuitive that's online, but we do now have it online on a K drive that's available only to the faculty members who can vote uh, on this. We also say that anybody who needs any paper copies we will provide, although, of course, they can print it too. Um, we, the department then meets, and we, we, we discuss, we also give some guidance regarding some of the materials. If a statement doesn't look clear enough, or if a statement needs more elaboration, or if a statement includes things that we think probably are not, um, are not the, the appropriate place, for example, complaining about something when, you know, for example, on, let's say complaining about something on teaching, because they didn't get something from the department as opposed to reflection about teaching and teaching development, we, we try to provide that guidance. Whether the faculty member chooses to follow those, those recommendations is, is a different question. Um, so finally, to talk very broadly about any wisdom that I can offer or any phases of the process, um, I think there are a couple of things I think you, you need to think about. Um, first thing is, what is the history and tradition of your department? Um, we're pretty, my department is pretty much straight shooters. We're known as being tough, but it's probably not as tough as I thought. Um, but we're pretty straight shooters about things. And we really try to have the tradition be very, very detailed and try to be very, very open about it. Departments really vary on these things. And I think the real question is, who in your department do you trust? Or who are the people that you, you know, that is who can you go to for advice on that? And sometimes it is the chair. Sometimes it's somebody who was recently promoted. But I think it's really important to figure out who those people are. And if your answer, you're thinking, well, I'm really not in a good position then because there's no one I trust. Who outside do you trust? Um, the second thing, I think, is the importance of communication transparency. And I know this sounds like these blurbs. You should be, you should communicate, you should be transparent. But I think it's very important for a department to be as well. And but I think you've got you have you have to figure those part out. Another point is detail. The one thing that probably frustrates committees more than anything else is not having enough detail in a report, not having enough detail in the dossier submitted. Um, you know, I, I can 
think of many cases in which a person says, I have, I published X number of articles and Y number of books since I was promoted to associate professor, but in the files, we don't see X, we see X minus one and Y minus two uh, in terms of the materials. Um, there's just sort of, or they refer to a title of an article and the article has a different title. Or there's just, just, just not enough detail on it. And I think the more detailed something is, the more clear something is, um, the more confidence people are going to have about it. I mean, it's you know, sort of like, you know, it's like, I keep on telling my grad students, you better double check everything that you write when you submit something for review, because even a grammatical error can raise a red flag and make people think, oh, this person's not careful. And this is as somebody who writes email messages these days that are filled with grammatical errors. But that's, that, I don't have to worry about that anymore. So, uh, but I think it's very important to give lots of detail, not just about research stuff, but also about teaching. Now, I don't know, I can't be too long, I, I don't know exactly how important teaching is in terms of promotion. What I can say, it should be important. And you should provide the information. It's like there's no, you know, people say, well, you know, it's like my evaluations, I can't find the evaluations. You know, people should know. You should have every single evaluation that you've, that you've taught. You know, um, now some people can be a little obsessive. I have my evaluations going back to 1981 when I was a grad student. And when I retire, I'm going to have a big bonfire. But the good news is in the future, everything's going to be electronic, so you will never lose your or not so good news in some cases, you will never lose your evaluations. And so that I think but I think it's very important to really have detail on that, to have very clear documentation. I also think it's important to really sort of think through your teaching statement in terms of you know what is your contribution on that. Um, I should make the same point about your research statement with one other caveat. The research statement needs to be written not for you and actually not even for your department. It has to be written, in my case for sociology, it would have to be written for somebody in chemistry and somebody, let's say, in comparative lit. Because they're going to not, you have to write it in a way that a, an educated person who knows nothing about your field can understand it. And I think that's very, very hard for us. So that's one thing I really encourage people to think. Think through sort of like, a sophisticated cocktail party long document. That's what you need to be writing. Um, and then finally, if there's something that is problematic, hiding it does not work. Okay, it doesn't work. It's better to address it, and it's better to talk about it with whoever you trust about the best way to deal with it. Um, I'll stop at this point. Um, turn to Jean. Thank you. So one of the things I uh, wanted to say first is that the procedures vary by unit. And if you have not seen your departmental or school faculty governance documents, you need to make sure you see them. Because let's just take the example of the committee. In some departments or units, it's actually the standard executive or personnel committee, it's not a specially appointed committee. In other departments, it is a specially appointed committee with experts in your area. In still other departments, particularly small departments, it's often every single full, fact, full professor and a few others from outside the department to get enough people to make a decision. Um, each department and, and school is going to have its own way of doing things, and so if you don't have copies of that, you really should. Wait, you know, it, whether you're coming up or hoping to come up next year or three years from now, you need to take a look at that because that's going to be the first set of procedures that will be adhered to. And when, if you're in the college, um, at the college level for the College Promotion Committee, we will have in the, there will be in the dossier your departmental or your unit governance procedures. So we don't start with assuming that everybody's gone through the same process. What we do is make sure we understand what the process is in the department. And I know that there's variation across campus. 
um, in the college because we have two new schools. Um, the media school has its own set of procedures, which are different than what the departments have that moved into the school. The School of Global and International Studies has a different set and so on. So it's really important that you make sure you get copies of that and make sure you understand them. I wanted to, um, I guess, start with what, uh, what isn't true. Because um, often in the spring, I will get an email or a call from a faculty member or a chair of a department. And they'll say, we kind of want to come in and talk to you because I think maybe this person or I want to come up, but, I, but I, I've heard that the college never approves X or Y. So I thought I would dispel some myths, rumors, I'm not sure. So what is it true? Um, it is not true that you can only get promoted to full professor um, excellence in research in the college. Um, that is not true, and it has never been true. It is not true that teaching doesn't matter, and that you can just slide by with kind of sub-effective teaching, and it won't matter. It is not true that the college never considers or promotes people based on balanced cases. In the recent past, um, I can think of at least three people who were promoted to full professor um, on a balanced case. It is not true that you have to be in rank X number of years before coming up for a promotion to full. Sometimes people have been an associate professor for two years. Sometimes they've been for 17 years. Um, everyone's career has taken different paths. And what the College Promotion Committee tries to do is to try and make sense by looking at your research, teaching, and service statements and the reports from the department to make sense of um, what your career has been and where it is at that point in time where we're making the decision about promotion. And so in some ways, it's a very unique decision in every single case, because you know, some people have been in rank longer, and some people have been in rank uh, for a shorter period of time. I know that the BFC and the BPFAA um, have a seven-year rule. And if you've been in rank seven years in um, the vice provost office will send to a department or a unit head um, a notification that you've been an associate professor for seven years and to ask that there be a, a careful look at the record to see whether it's time for a promotion. There's no nothing more formal than that, and there's usually no pressure. But after the seventh year, these uh, reminders come through to the unit every year. Um, and it's up to faculty and their departments to make the decision about whether it's appropriate to come up. <clears throat> what is uh, accurate about the College Promotion Committee? And I'll go through the process, but first let me say that the majority of promotion to full professor cases are based on excellence in research. But we have promoted people in the last, I've been chair of the College Promotion Committee for five years. Um, we have promoted people on balance cases. We have promoted people on excellence in teaching. We have promoted at least one case on excellence in service. The majority have been on excellence in research. In all cases where it's excellence in one area, area the other two must be at least effective in teaching and satisfactory in the third area. Um, when I came up, I came up for promotion decades ago. And at the time, the story was you only got promoted on research, and teaching didn't matter, and blah, blah, blah. And in fact, even then, that wasn't true. But it's even less, less true now. Um, to reassure all of you, <laughs> and, and my friend Brian here, teaching matters a whole lot. Um, the college committee um, has been known in the past to turn people down for promotion with extraordinary research records, but whose teaching has shown that they just don't care and they're not trying to do a good job. Um, and we believe that teaching is, it, 
we all live a, are supposed to live a balanced professional life, and teaching is part of what we're expected to do and to try to do well. Um, the College Promotion Committee looks very carefully at the syllabi, at the range of courses being taught, at the level of courses being taught, going from first year for introductory courses to graduate courses. Um, they look at peer reviews, which in fact, by the way, are done really badly. And I'm going to have a conversation with chairs and directors in the college. I said done badly. They're not done in many departments. And um, they are, though, a requirement of the campus. So um, there's going to be some conversations I'll be having with our, our leaders in the college. Um, we look at course evaluations. And, and we, we do expect that there will be a course evaluation for every course. And when there isn't, someone at the table notices. And actually, members of the College Promotion Committee read through all of these documents. They read through the longhand comments. They read through the numbers. They are very, very careful um, and look at every detail of the course evaluations. But you don't have to be between a 3.0 and a 4.0 in order to get effective in teaching. You look at the whole picture. So we also look at your teaching statement. We look at if there's been a problem area in your teaching, what have you done to try and address it or improve it? So there really is a sense of trying to capture who you see yourself as in, in your instructional role. We look at PhD committees, how many you're on, if, if you have a doctoral program in your unit. We look at honors and other, other kind of undergraduate mentoring, so a whole variety of things. And for some people, there are also publications. And I should tell you that usually it's having publications that lift people from the very good to the excellent category in teaching in the college. It really is a fully rounded picture. Um, but the bar for effective is really um, showing that you are making an effort, that you have good student responses, and that you're engaged with students at some level, if not many levels. Um, balanced cases um, are not very well defined by the university. Um, they're kind of uh, like um, A minus across the board. Um, a minus in research, A minus in teaching, A minus in service. So you're not quite excellent, but you got to be exceptionally good in all three areas. And they're hard. It's hard to document, and it's hard to achieve. But um, it is possible. And in fact, um, we often see it in cases where faculty have been continuing their research, serving their department or university in administrative positions as an associate professor. Um, have excellent classroom teaching, but don't quite have either the number of journal articles or the book published at the right place or something that doesn't quite raise one of those categories to the excellent level. Um, it's unusual. Over uh, the last five years, I think we've promoted three people on balance case, but it is doable. And at the campus level, there may have been more than that. Other schools outside of the college, I think, have a, a, a little bit more liberal in um, how they uh, award promotion based on balanced cases. In terms of the timeline, um, usually in college, professors are in rank as associate professor um, somewhere between four and seven years before coming up for promotion, unless they've been hired in as an associate professor. Um, I think I've seen exactly one case of an assistant professor being bumped over the associate professor level. It was an extraordinary case, and I don't think it happens more than once in a lifetime. Um, in some cases, I noticed it's longer. People are, and, and I'll say this. I'll put on my old hat of the Dean for Women's Affairs. It was a long time ago now, 15 or 16 years ago, we did a study on the status of women on this campus. And one of the things we found is that women tend to stay longer in rank at the associate level than do men. Um, often women, almost immediately once they're tenured, are asked to move into administrative positions, and that kind of sucks their time. 
Um, I've experienced this as well, so I know I know what the pattern is. And for some women, it also means they put off childbearing or the second child till they get tenure. There are a whole lot of reasons that go into this, but on the whole, women have not only in the college but across the university are in rank at the associate professor level about five to seven years longer than men before they come up for promotion. I would really like to see that change. It has changed slightly over the last 10 years. I think part of the issue is that when people thought that you didn't, that service didn't matter and balanced cases weren't possible and, and teaching didn't count, then it seemed like the only way you could get promoted was having this extraordinary research record. And when you're doing all these other things that supposedly didn't count, well, that made it harder. We're trying to, maybe the word is being more humane, but we also recognize that we live in a community that relies on thoughtful faculty administration and careful teaching, and that we need to include that in our model of how you uh, made it. And making it is not just in terms of establishing a national or international research reputation. It's also about these other things that we do that are part of what make um, this university great. Um, let me talk a little bit about the process at the college level. Um, as I said earlier, we defer to the departmental um, procedures. Um, Sometimes those procedures don't work for an individual, either because a department is rent with conflict and we have to figure out other ways to make sure that people get reviewed objectively. And in those cases, we create special situations with memorandum of understanding and we work with the BPFAA to make sure that someone's career isn't stopped just because their department is at war with each other. Um, it's not, it's never an easy situation, but we, we make it possible um, to at least try and approximate an objective process in those cases. But normally we, we expect the procedure to follow the departmental written um, faculty governance documents. Um, the early role the college plays is in approving the external letter writer. And we ask departments to submit the six names for the applicant who's coming up and the six names that the department has supposedly come up with independently. But we all know that there's going to be communication about this. So there are 12 names right now. And what the college does, and usually the request goes to the associate dean um, in the arts and humanities or the social sciences or the natural and mathematical sciences to do the initial approval of three names from each list and then usually some alternates from each list. Because in those cases, it's not like what happened in sociology. In those cases, you usually have to go, I would say, to 10 people or so before you get the six, the six names. In some cases, it's far more than that. And if it's up exponentially more than that, then we intervene and try and figure out what's going on. Um, but what we're looking for um, are scholars who are full professors, one, who have expertise in the area, who have a national or international reputation, and who, in general, are from peer or aspirant institutions. Now, in some cases, the best person to write about this is at a, one of the top 10 liberal arts colleges. Um, and usually we'll say, fine, you can get someone from Oberlin, but we don't want three people from liberal arts colleges. We want to have a, a predominance of people from Research One institutions. I think we're pretty um, <coughs> flexible in working with the chair of the department. There are sometimes conflicts between the person who was coming up, the faculty member coming up, and the department over the list of names. As soon as those conflicts appear, um, I, I, I encourage you to insist that there be a conversation with someone in the dean's office so we can resolve them before they turn into a mess. Um, but on the whole, the college stays out of this until the department has made um, its recommendation. 
It's important to remember that all of these decisions are recommendations until the final decision, which is made by the provost and the president, and then referred to the board of trustees for their confirmation. Even what the college does is just a recommendation to the next level. Very seldom is the college recommendation overturned, but rare, occasionally it is, very infrequently. Um, occasionally, the college committee overturns the departmental recommendation, but then again, relatively infrequently. But they're all recommendations. The only thing that's final is what happens at the provost and the presidential level. The college committee, um, there are now two committees in the college. There's a college tenure committee, which the executive dean chairs. And it has a membership of, I think, 12, 10 or 12 people, depending upon how many tenure cases there are. The College Promotion Committee is chaired by me, and it will be chaired by the person who replaces me, the Associate Executive Dean, next year. There are six members of the committee in addition to me. They are all full professors. Um, there are two representing the arts and humanities, two representing the social um, and historical sciences and uh, studies, and two representing the natural and mathematical sciences. In all cases, if someone from their own department or my department is coming up, we are recused. In my case, the dean comes in and oversees that particular discussion. In the other cases, the, the faculty member on the committee from geological sciences is recused when someone from geology comes up. We are also recused, we recuse ourselves um, when there might be a conflict of interest. And it get, this gets back to the kind of the question of conflict of interest that Brian raised. So um, just to give an example, last year, um, someone on the committee is from geological sciences. And, and, and last year, um, we were Moving merrily along, we usually have between 22 and 30 cases a year. So we do a lot of work um, in the fall semester. And um, we were looking at the case of someone from a department that was not geological sciences. And he started reading the case. And he said, oh my god, this person is married to one of my colleagues. So immediately, he left the room <laughs> and stopped looking and did not have a vote. Um, uh, if there is a close friendship, we rely on members of the committee to be honest and to say, you know, this person is a really good friend of mine. I just don't think I can evaluate it fairly and objectively. Um, and my experience is that people do take this committee and the tenure committee very, very seriously. We never talk about the cases outside when the process is um, when we're in the process of making the evaluation. Um, and if they think there's any possibility of a conflict of interest, they will recuse themselves. Um, because we really want this to be as clean, as fair, um, and as good a decision and, as it can be. The way the college committee operates is very much the way the college tenure committee operates. Two people are assigned to be the primary readers of the dossier. There's a first reader and a second reader. Each of those readers prepares a report that varies between two and four pages long prior to the committee meeting. We have a committee meeting usually once or twice a week. Each meeting lasts for three hours, and we usually look at two or three people in a session. Um, the reports are, are uh, the draft reports are written by the two readers, but everyone on the committee is expected to read everything in the dossier. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that they're going to plow their way through, we had a meeting this morning, 68 physics articles. Um, but what it does mean is they're going to take a very careful look at the CV. They're going to read very carefully the chair's report, the committee report from the department, the, all the letters, all of the statements, the research teaching service statements, all go through all the teaching materials. and delve into what they can make sense of, of the actual research itself. Um, because we rely on the department and the external letter writers to address the quality issue of the research, usually, um, 
We use yeah, signifiers for quality by looking at where the articles are published or whether they're publishing with Cambridge University Press or some press we, none, of, none of us have, has ever heard of. Um, so there are some decisions about quality that, that we are very deferential to the department and to the external letter writers. Um, but we still make some decisions about quality. Um, we look at quantity in terms of publications, we look at quality in terms of publications. I've already described to you what we do in terms, in terms of teaching. Um, the external letters, we parse every single word. And, um, you know, if there aren't any this person, we don't really expect them to say this person walks on water, but we really do expect them to say they're a leader in their area of research if that's the way, basis upon which they're growing up. And if, if it's only warm um, endorsement, well, you know, I'll tell you this, normally one, one not so positive letter won't hurt you, more than one will. Um, there can always be one crank, and actually we're really attuned to cranky people as well, so whether they're in the department. One negative vote, by the way, your department votes, and let's say you've got 12 full professors and there are two negative votes and the rest are, you know, hearty endorsement. We'll try and figure out why those two are negative, and in most cases the chair will say, well, this person votes no on everything, and the other person never comes to meetings and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, there are ways that you're protected from minor, I'll call them the cranks. <laughs> um, we also look at service. Service is not unimportant. And we look for depth and for breadth. And if somebody has only done service in the last two years after they, uh, you know, prior to promotion, there are lots of wagging and shaking of fingers around the table because it is true that once you're promoted to full, you're expected there are, actually there's a written statement about the responsibilities of tenured full professors. And it is not only to be a mentor to your colleagues and to help lead in research, but to help run the university and, and that means to be engaged in service in one way or another, at the departmental level, at the school level, or at the university level, or all of them. What we do is, um, after discussing each case, we, um, we have a ballot, and each, um, each person on the committee votes. It's then tabulated, and we share the vote with everyone on the committee at, at, the, at that time. And they vote um, in the same way departments vote. That is, they vote up or down for promotion, and then they vote in the three categories, research, teaching, and service. Um, if any of those are not if any of the votes are either split on the college committee or unified on, uh, um, so that in one of the areas it would be a negative, ineffective teaching. What we do is then we make sure we've got all the information we need. That is, sometimes there are some missing course evaluations or sometimes there aren't peer reviews or some other things might be missing. I then go back to the chair of the department and say, we need these things, the file is incomplete. Um, the committee then revotes, takes a look at any new material that's come in by the end of the semester and revotes the case. So if it's not a consensus positive for promotion, we always take a second look at it. Um, if it's missing information, we try and get that information and then revote those cases. Um, as I said, we usually have 20 to 30 cases each fall. We, we're supposed to get our recommendations into the Vice Provost's office by the second week of December. Um, what we do is the committee, I do not vote with the committee, although I know what their vote is. Their votes are then, and the reports they've written, um, are give, I, I have them and I share them with the executive dean of the college and he and I sit down and then I write a report on behalf of the college recommending for our best promotion and it goes on to the next level. Um, there's never been a case where the dean and I disagree um, and if there were, um, we would talk it out and sort it out before we sent it forward. Um, uh, if it is a negative vote, 
what we've done is because you can always come up for promotion again. Um, before I send it forward to the campus level, if it were to be a negative from the college, I contact the chair and ask them to talk to the candidate and tell them what the what the recommendation would be from the college and give them the opportunity to either add an additional material or to withdraw. And they can withdraw the whole dossier and not have it go forward. Um, and, what, and then we work out the next time around what we do with the letters that have already been um, requested and so on. So what we try and do is be as humane as possible in those situations where it looks like it might there will be a negative recommendation. Um, this is something we've done over the last couple of years, and actually, I think it's been very it's been helpful for fa those few faculty who are in those situations because then they can rethink. They can either decide they want to take the risk and go to the next level. Or they can say, you know what, I'm going to pull it back. I, I know I, it will be stronger in a year or two, and, and I'll just wait for that. And no harm, no foul, except all the work you put into pulling together the dossier at the beginning um, the first time around. But we're trying to be as supportive as we can and give as much advice as we can to make this as positive a process as possible. Better stop there. I think you want so to, at this you, point we can open the floor and that includes those who are attending online because I'm monitoring chat. So if anybody has questions or comments. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, we don't have any questions for online. Okay. That's exactly how to do it. Step well, yeah. <laughs> Laura, <laughs> how do we not excite um, the college that we're planning to go? So what what is supposed to happen is you talk to your chair, mm -hmm. and and then your 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 chair would write uh, would write us a write me a letter and say you're planning to come up. And usually um, that happens in um, early to mid spring. It really depends on the the timeline in your own department. Um, we, the college sends um, uh, information about uh, the tenure process and the promotion process and the deadlines for the next year to chairs um, usually by mid-March and usually the deadline for um, notifying the college and um, is usually April sometime, and for getting the external letter writer nominations in, it's usually I think the beginning of June. It might be sometime in May. Actually, you know, um, we're trying to get people to send out the request for letter writers earlier and earlier because we don't pay people to write letters. Some universities do, um, and. Um, in some areas, you know, people are asked several times for to, it's a lot of work to write a letter because you've got to be through the whole dossier and, um, and actually pay serious attention to the research. So um, I think we're moving the deadline back a little bit, but in, um, in your case, for instance, um, I think they usually have let us know in the past in April. So that's quite confusing given um, Brian's timeline for your department was um, March. March is when March is when the the report this is March is when the associate professor is supposed to provide materials for us for us to do to have a subcommittee look at it. And so the subcommittee then will take a month to a month and a half to look at that material. That's that's prior to the request for letters. Right. right, but I mean that's even prior yeah. to the notification to the chair that you want to go. Through. Right. So some, some. I mean, what is supposed? Okay. So ideally, what's supposed to be happening is there's regular and continual conversation with your chair about your career. That in your annual review, what whatever committee in the department does merit reviews will also be identifying this person should really be coming up, and they should have told you this. Um, that's ideal, doesn't always happen. Um, I know. 
But um, the deadlines are not carved in stone. So there's always, uh, there, every, every unit, every department, every school has its own internal deadline um, that's really based on their capacity to review people's records and make decisions about whether they think it makes sense for someone to go up. Um, but if we get, you know, on, honestly, one year we got a notification from the department in October that they wanted to put someone up for a promotion. And that fall. We made it happen that fall. <laughs> and we, we, we made it happen. It's very unusual. But we, you know, we're, there is flexibility built into the system. I have a second question. Um, I've been here for nine years now. I've never had a peer review. Um, I've never had anyone observe my teaching. So I will get them. Um, <laughs> um, but will that be negatively viewed? Yeah. Well, yeah. If, I, if I crunch them all into this year and a half? I, th I think you just um, all, what? This morning we reviewed four cases, and two were re reviews, and um, none of them had their observations. It's so strange. There are some departments that just yeah. haven't done it. I mean, I've done reviews, I've right. done peer reviews for assistant professors. Yes. But I came in as an associate, no one ever reviewed right. me. I've done a lot of guest lectures right. for my colleagues. Um, so one of the wonderful things about teaching and research and service statements is you can say what you want in there. And that's the place to provide the context. Hey, I had, um, I asked people to come in and review me while, uh, to observe one of my classes. It is not standard procedure. It has not been standard procedure in my department. Um, and the committee at our level would say, Thanks for the explanation. Right. Well, it's a very, it won't it's a very odd situation because my department no longer exists. Yes, I know. I know. I know. As you know. I know. So, and I know that in anthropology they do do that. So I will get them now right. in my new department. Right. So, that, I mean, I'm, I'm not being facetious when I say it's one of the great things about statements. You can put, this is your, your reflection on your career and, and all of the odd things about it as well as the exciting things about it and everything else in between. You can include. I, I, Brian is right. You don't want to say, well, they didn't give me the resources I needed, but you can say, you know what? I was in a department that didn't do peer observation of post tenure faculty. Okay. Uh, what I'm asking about is so varied, the only possible answer is it depends on the department. But I'm <laughs> wondering if you could illuminate just a little bit in terms of, you mentioned Dallas cases and cases where people have even been promoted on the basis of service. I'm wondering if you could say a bit about what service looks like that is adequate to promotion and as opposed to the work. kind of service that is more superlative to those cases. Yeah. So in order to get promoted on service, you really have to have national presence um, um, as well as local and professional and so on so that um, um, you started a new professional association in which, uh, you know, many, an interdisciplinary uh, professional association in which you are kind of the founding leader, but also have um, helped establish and served as editor of an interdisciplinary journal and so on. And then everything at the campus level and at the departmental level, and it really is the demonstration of the Public intellectual is another way that we talked about it. There was one uh, case years ago I, I can think of where the research was not um, refereed in a traditional way. It was actually research for um, government agency that was then used to actually reform policy, national, federal policy. That kind of fell between the cracks between what is research because it wasn't in the referee venue, but it clearly had an enormous impact. And in that case, um, uh, I think it counted as service because that was the basis on which the, the case was constructed. Um, really, in that case, it was really there was a concern that it wouldn't count for research because it didn't have that imprimatur of you know being refereed. In the same way. Just answer that question. I'm just really curious about this. 
what would a letter, external letter, be for someone going up on a balanced case? So we, we've been struggling with this because what um, there is a template that comes from BPFAA, and it makes absolutely no sense. And, and I, I've told them that several times, and I've tried to construct one, but it's really hard. So we try and describe it. And usually what happens is that, let's say, two of the external reviewers speak to the research, two speak to service and its national um, or professional components, and, and if possible, two speak to teaching. And, the national reputation in teaching is either on the basis of publications, a textbook, or articles, subtle, you know, uh, kinds of things, or um, leadership in the transformation of a curriculum. In my case, for instance, um, um, when I came up, um, I had, um, I didn't come up on teaching, but um, I was, um, had redesigned the curriculum for the advanced placement programs in political science. So I had all of these national things that I had done and people from across the country at universities who could speak to that. So the teaching letters for a balanced case or for coming up um, just on teaching are, are really kind of unusual too. And they're really tied to the unique contributions of the person who's coming up. Um, I would say that in general, in the science departments, they're really um, they're, uh, uh, very focused on research as the primary mode. But even in a science department, you've seen someone come up for promotion not on research and been successful. So <laughs> this question's a little bit of field, but it, does this does going up for promotion, it just occurred to me, does it change our leave the you know, sabbatical schedule or in any way? No, it doesn't if you haven't taken that. it before promotion, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah it does post seven years or whatever. whatever. Okay. And um, the only thing um, that um, the committee tries not to say, oh they've been in this person's been in rank X years and should have done twice as much. They're not supposed to say that. Basically it's just have you met the bar? Um, the um, different units across the university, in addition to getting a new title, give salary, automatic salary increases. The college does a 15% increase when you get promoted to full. I don't know that other schools do that. I know that there's variation across schools, but it doesn't affect leaves or staff. I'm not from the college, but I'm curious to know what's the procedure for nomination, recommendation, appointment for the cut to uh, campus uh, promotion and tenure committee from the college. Oh, so we are um, every summer. I am um, contacted by the vice provost or an associate vice provost and asked to give a list of names that they might ask to be on the committee. Um, we often look for people who've been a chair or director, so has some experience, or have served on the college committee. Um, at a minimum, um, we're looking for people who we think can represent the college views that our careers are multifaceted and need to be balanced across the three areas. And, um, and we usually give several names, and then they choose from among the names we give them. I, can I say one last thing? And that is that my feeling is often people hold off too long to um, ask that their department look at them for a promotion. Maybe in, in many cases, it, I'm not talking about people who've only been in rank four years, but you know, six or seven years. Often, often your record is there. You, people often don't see it as being there. But I, I would say better to start talking with the, your chair earlier rather than later because I, I do think that sometimes people hold off because they're afraid it's going to be a no. And, and usually, as, as Brian said, um, we're, we're tough. We have standards, but it's not as rigid 
as um, I think people think it is. We've already made a commitment to all of to everybody by giving them tenure, you know. So we really want to kind of um, embrace the excellence that people have, and everyone has a different kind of set of contributions. 